Marx and Sazen, Chapter 3, Ruined Faith, Engels' Counter-Conversion. Since Friedrich Engels figures prominently in Marx's life, I will give brief material about him. Engels had been brought up in a pietistic family. In fact, in his youth, he had composed beautiful Christian poems. After meeting Marx, he wrote about him, quote, Who is chasing wild endeavour? A black man from Trier, a remarkable monster. He does not walk or run. He jumps on his heels and rages, full of anger, as if he would like to catch the wide tent of the sky and throw it to the earth. He stretches his arms far away in the air. The wicked fist is clenched. He rages without ceasing, as if ten thousand devils had caught him by the hair. End quote. Engels had begun to doubt the Christian faith after reading a book written by a liberal theologian, Bruno Bauer. He had a great struggle in his heart. He wrote at the time, quote, I pray every day, indeed almost all day, for truth, and I have done so ever since I began to doubt, but still I cannot go back. My tears are welling as I write, End quote. Engels never found his way back to the word of God, joining instead the one whom he himself had called the monster possessed by ten thousand devils. He had experienced a counter-conversion. What kind of person was Bruno Bauer, the liberal theologian who played a decisive role in the destruction of Engels' Christian faith and who endorsed Marx in his new anti-Christian ways? Did he have any connection with demons? Like Engels himself, he started life as a believer and later as a conservative theologian, even writing against critics of the Bible. Afterwards, he himself became a radical critic of the Holy Scriptures and creator of a materialist Christianity which insisted that Jesus was only human, not the Son of God. Bauer wrote to his friend Arnold Rouge, also a friend of Marx and Engels, on December 6, 1841. Quote, I deliver lectures here at the university before a large audience. I don't recognise myself when I pronounce my blasphemies from the pulpit, they are so great that these children, whom nobody should offend, have their hair standing on end. While delivering the blasphemies, I remember how I work piously at home, writing an apology of the Holy Scriptures and of the Revelation. In any case, it is a very bad demon that possesses me, as often as I ascend the pulpit, and I am so weak that I am compelled to yield to him. My spirit of blasphemy will be satisfied only if I am authorised to preach openly as professor of the atheistic system. End quote. The man who convinced him to become a communist was the same Moses Hess who had previously convinced Marx. Hess wrote after meeting Engels in Cologne, quote, He parted from me as an overzealous communist. This is how I produce ravages. End quote. To produce ravages, was this Hess's supreme purpose in life? It is Lucifer's, too. The traces of having been a Christian never disappeared from Engels' mind. In 1865, he expressed his admiration for the Song of the Reformation, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, calling it a triumphal hymn which became the Marseillaise of the 16th century. There are also other such pro-Christian statements from his pen. The tragedy of Engels is moving and even more gripping than that of Marx. Here is a wonderful Christian poem written in his youth by the man who would later become Marx's greatest accomplice in the attempted destruction of religion. Quote, Lord Jesus Christ, God's only Son, O step down from thy heavenly throne and save my soul for me. Come down in all thy blessedness, light of thy Father's holiness. Grant that I may choose thee, lovely, splendid, Without sorrow is the joy with which we raise, Saviour, unto thee our praise. And when I draw my dying breath, and must endure the pangs of death, firm to thee may I hold, that when my eyes with dark are filled, and when my beating heart is stilled, in thee shall I grow cold. Up in heaven shall my spirit praise thy name eternally, since it lies safe in thee. O oh, were the time of joy but nigh, when from thy loving bosom I might draw new life that warms, and then, O oh God, with thanks to thee, shall I embrace those dear to me, forever in my arms, ever, ever, ever living, the abiding to behold, shall my life anew unfold. Thou camest, humankind, to free from death and ill that there might be, blessings and fortune everywhere, 
and now with this thy new descent, on earth or shall be different, to each man shalt thou give his share. End quote. After Bruno Bauer had sown doubts in his soul, Engels wrote to some friends, quote, It is written, Ask, and it shall be given unto you. I seek truth wherever I have the hope of finding at least a shadow of it. Still, I cannot recognize your truth as the eternal truth. Yet it is written, Seek, and ye shall find. Who is the man among you who would give to his child a stone when it asks for bread? Even less will your father who is in heaven. Tears come into my eyes while I write this. I am moved through and through, but I feel I will not be lost. I will come to God, after whom my soul longs. This, too, is a witness of the Holy Spirit. With this I live, and with this I die. The Spirit of God witnesses to me that I am a child of God. End quote. Engels was very well aware of the danger of Satanism. In his book Schelling, Philosopher in Christ, Engels wrote, quote, Since the terrible French Revolution, an entirely new, devilish spirit has entered into a great part of mankind, and godlessness lifts its daring head in such an unashamed and subtle manner that you would think the prophecies of Scripture are fulfilled now. Let us see first what the Scriptures say about godlessness of the last times. The Lord Jesus Christ says in Matthew 24, 11-13, Many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many, and because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of this kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. And then in verse 24, there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that, if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. And St. Paul says in 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, that man of sin shall be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is God or that is worshipped. The coming of the wicked is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion, that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned, who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. End quote. Engels quotes scripture after scripture, just as the most Bible-believing theologian would do. He continues, quote, We have nothing to do any more with indifference or coldness towards the Lord. No, it is an open, declared enmity, and in the place of all sects and parties, we have now only two, Christians and anti-Christians. We see the false prophets among us. They travel throughout Germany and wish to intrude everywhere. They teach their satanic teachings in the marketplaces and bear the flag of the devil from one town to another, seducing the poor youth in order to throw them in the deepest abyss of hell and death. End quote. He finishes this book with the words of Revelation. Quote, Behold, I come soon. Keep what you have that nobody takes away from you your crown. Amen. End quote. The man who wrote such poems and such warnings against Satanism, the man who prayed with tears to beware of this danger, the man who recognized Marx as being possessed with a thousand devils, became Marx's closest collaborator in the devilish fight. For communism abolishes eternal truths, it abolishes all religion and all morality. Liberal theology had accomplished this monstrous change. Thus, it shares with Marx and Engels the guilt for the tens of millions of innocents killed by communism to date. What spiritual tragedy! Marx hates whole nations. Shifting now from Engels to Marx, Marx's whole attitude and conversation were satanic in nature. Though a Jew, he wrote a pernicious anti-Jewish book called The Jewish Question. In 1856, he wrote in the New York Tribune an article entitled The Russian Loan, in which we read, quote, We know that behind every tyrant stands a Jew, as a Jesuit stands behind every pope. As the army of the Jesuits kills every free thought, so the desire of the oppressed would have chances of success, the usefulness of wars incited by capitalists would cease, 
if it were not for the Jews who steal the treasures of mankind. It is no wonder that 1,856 years ago, Jesus chased the usurers from the Jerusalem temple. They were like the contemporary usurers who stand behind tyrants and tyrannies. The majority of them are Jewish. The fact that Jews have become so strong as to endanger the life of the world causes us to disclose their organization, their purpose, that its stench might awaken the workers of the world to fight and eliminate such a canker. End quote. Did Hitler say anything worse than this? Strangely, Marx also wrote to the contrary in The Capital, Volume 1, under the heading The Capitalist Character of Manufacture. In the front of the chosen people, it was written that they are the property of Jehovah. Many other Jewish communists imitated Marx in their hatred of Jews. Ruth Fischer, renowned German Jewish communist leader and a member of parliament, said, Squash the Jewish capitalists, hang them from the lampposts, tread them under your feet. Why just the Jewish capitalists and not the others remains an unanswered question. Marx hated not only the Jews, but also the Germans. Beating is the only means of resurrecting the Germans. He spoke about the stupid German people, the disgusting national narrowness of the Germans, and also said that Germans, Chinese and Jews have to be compared with peddlers and small merchants. He called the Russians cabbage eaters. The Slavic peoples were ethnic trash. He expressed his hatred of many nations, but never his love. Marx wrote in his New Year's Roundup of 1848 about the Slavic riffraff, which included Russians, Czechs and Croats. These retrograde races had nothing left for them by fate except the immediate task of perishing in the revolutionary world storm. The coming world war will cause not only reactionary classes and dynasties, but entire reactionary peoples to disappear from the face of the earth, and that will be progress. Their very name will vanish. Neither Marx nor Engels were concerned about the destruction of millions of people. The former wrote, quote, a silent, unavoidable revolution is taking place in society, a revolution that cares as little about the human lives it destroys as an earthquake cares about the houses it ravages. Classes and races that are too weak to dominate the new conditions of existence will be defeated. End quote. In contrast, Hitler, who desired only the enslavement and not the destruction of these nations, was much more humane than Marx. Engels wrote in the same vein, quote, the next world war will make whole reactionary peoples disappear from the face of the earth. This too is progress. Obviously this cannot be fulfilled without crushing some delicate national flower, but without violence and without pitilessness, nothing can be obtained in history. End quote. Marx, the man who posed as a fighter for the proletariat, called this class of people stupid boys, rogues, asses. Engels well knew what to expect from them. He wrote, The democratic, red, yes, even the communist mob will never love us. Marx identified black people with idiots and constantly used the offensive term nigger in private correspondence. He called his rival LaSalle the Jewish nigger and made it very clear that this was not intended as an epithet of disdain for just one person. Quote, it is now absolutely clear to me, as both the shape of his head and his hair texture shows, he is descended from the Negroes who joined Moses' flight from Egypt, unless his mother or grandmother on the paternal side hybridized with a nigger. The pushiness of the fellow is also nigger-like. End quote. Marx even championed slavery in North America. For this, he quarreled with his friend Proudhon, who had advocated the emancipation of slaves in the US. Marx wrote in response... Quote, Without slavery, North America, the most progressive of countries, would be transformed into a patriarchal country. Wipe North America from the map of the world and you will have anarchy. The complete decay of modern commerce and civilization. Abolish slavery and you will have wiped America off the map of the nations. End quote. Marx also wrote, The devil take the British. In spite of such denunciations, there are plenty of British, as well as American, Marxists. Satan is in the family. 
Marx's favourite daughter, Eleanor, with her father's approval, married Edward Everling. He lectured on such subjects as the wickedness of God. Just as Satanists do, unlike atheists, they do not deny the existence of God, except to deceive others. They know of his existence, but describe him as wicked. In his lectures, he tried to prove that God is an encourager of polygamy and an instigator to theft. He advocated the right to blaspheme. The following poem describes the attitudes of his movement towards Satanism. Quote, to thee, my verses, unbridled and daring, shall mount, O Satan, king of the banquet, away with thy sprinkling, O priest, and thy droning, for never shall Satan, O priest, stand behind thee. Thy breath, O Satan, my verses inspires, when from my bosom the gods I defy, of kings pontifical, of kings inhuman, thine is the lightning that sets minds to shaking, O soul that wanderest far from the straight way, Satan is merciful. See, Heloisa, like the whirlwind spreading its wings, he passes, O people, Satan the Great. Hail of reason, the great vindicator, sacred to thee shall rise incense and vows, thou hast the god of the priest disenthroned. <laughs>